So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a kind of quick whistle-stop tour through an amazing 10 years of filmmaking. <laughs> This Ten young years. lady has made over 80 films. I know, that's yeah. mental, isn't it? We were trying to work it out a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, I think I've done over 50. And then I was like, actually, it might be over 60. And then you were like, I think it's over 80. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was over 80 we could find. Yes. And there's probably yeah, yeah. lots of other ones <laughs> hidden around the place. Uh -huh. And been to probably more countries, I would guess, than everybody else in this room put But together. not you. <laughs> no, okay. You beat me. I've been to a few more. OK, uh -huh. so... <laughs> of a competition of how many <laughs> countries we've been to. Um, so <coughs> before, we're going to go right back to the beginning okay. in a minute. Oh, I hate but these But before clips. we do that, let's... I hate these clips. Great. I can't so bear so it. so young. Uh. She looks so young. Huh? Tell us about what... Before we go back to the beginning, let's talk about what's next. So what's, what, okay. what are you working on at the moment? So at the minute, do you know what? It's really interesting because it's totally different to things that I typically tend to do. Um, so it's in the UK. Um, and we're essentially looking at how youngsters are now buying their Class A drugs online through social apps. Um, and it's been quite handy and it's been really interesting and it's been a bit of a learning curve for me, I suppose, as well, because I'm now kind of um, helping to produce. So instead of just turning up and going, I'm ready to present, I'm sort of quite involved editorially and I'm sort of going on the recce's and having to know that the contributors that I think might be quite good to talk to, um, so it will feel quite different, and I think as well, if it's rubbish, I've got no one else to blame, so <laughs> <laughs> please say how awesome you think it is, even if you're just entertaining me, um, so yeah, that's what I've been working on. We were on. chatting earlier on, and you were saying you didn't quite realise how much work went into I totally, the preparation. No, it's true, I totally underestimated the enormity, you know, it takes, we were certainly working on this for four, or four to six weeks before going out and starting filming. Um, and, and it's just, just swanning glass. in. I know. Going, here I am. No, it's point true. Me, I'm a yeah, I'm ready. I'm here. Um, <laughs> but you know, I was going up to Glasgow, and you know, for obvious reasons, some of the characters, some of the people that we were spending time with, were so fascinating, but really quite chaotic. You know, their lives. You know, we're meeting here one minute, and then we're not because X has just been stabbed, and so you know, you have to really um, roll with the punches and, and try and make sure that you secure these people that are going to be able to tell tell their story in a very clear, concise way. So, yeah, it's been, it's been really worthwhile. <coughs> so, back to the beginning. Yes. You were working in Luton Airport. I was. What and <laughs> it's just so, so funny, right? When I first started doing the docs, every time, you know, one of the sort of highbrow posh papers would, would do a write-up about how awful my accent was or, you know, what a caricature I was, every single, um, every single paragraph would start with, if you... If you can remember Stacey Dooley, dot, 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 a Luton shop assistant from Luton Airport, and every time for about three or four years, that's what they started with, um, which I'm very proud of. It was a nice, nice gig. Um, I worked at Luton Airport, and then I saw this advert, <coughs> and it was with, um, they were now Wiltshire, but it was with um, Ricochet at the time, and they were looking for six contributors, so six people who were really interested in fast sort of throwaway um, consumerism, you know, when Primark had really taken off and it was really trendy, you know, Colleen Rooney was running about wearing six quid t-shirts, you know, everybody was, was shopping in that way. So they wanted to, to bring us to India and show us firsthand, you know, wh what the truth really was and the kids that were there making these garments working sort of 15, 16 hours a day. Um, and I remember, like, really vividly the girl on the, the researcher on, on the phone saying, you know, it might be quite intense, you'll have to sleep under the sewing machine, you might see things that you find quite upsetting, are you down with that? And I was like, yeah. And again, really didn't realise at that point, obviously, how enormous the, the whole programme um, would end up being to, to me. And, and, you know, it shaped, shaped the next ten years, which is so mental, isn't it? It totally changed my life. I don't, I don't think that's the sort of overstatement. Um, yeah, so thank God I did it. <laughs> I'd still be at the airport. <laughs> yeah. Let's have a look at the clip. <laughs> yes. Ah. Ah! Oh, my Lord. So as you can see, I was a talent from the start. <laughs> Some miracle I haven't been tapped into sooner, really. <laughs> oh. Um. Why, what makes you cringe about that? <laughs> um, no, do you know what? That, that was such, um, it was such an important trip for me. 
And I think <clears throat> Danny Cohen, the guy who, who was in charge of, of the channel at the time, was so brave to, to give me this platform. Because after this, um, he commissioned two 60 Minutes and it was just me. And I remember him, him calling me in and, and saying, you know, I found you sort of naturally quite inquisitive and, you know, you ask questions that we're all thinking, there's empathy there, you know, you can sympathize. H how do you fancy perhaps trying it on your own? And me just thinking, oh, that sounds, yeah, that sounds really exciting. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, and, you know, you grow, don't you? You know, as, as the years go by, you, you understand what works and, and how you want to... Um, treat people and how you want to get the story across. But, you know, I was, I was so naive. You know, you've got to remember, I'd never left Europe, you know. So when, when they sort of threw me into this world, everything, I found everything, like, remarkable. Everything was fascinating. The idea that they didn't have a toilet was like, r really? You know, not everybody... Because I'd come from this luxurious, safe space, and then I was seeing how vulnerable some of these kids were, and it just felt very wrong and... and um, very unfair and unjust, and then I came home and started campaigning, and yeah, the rest is, is history. <laughs> so there were six of you who were chosen yeah. to do Blood, Sweat and Tears. <coughs> exactly. What happens to the other five? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I'm pally with, um, there's a really sweet girl, Tara, who I'm, who I'm still pally with, and she's doing very well. Um, her and her mother had a clothing line, actually, that mm -hmm. was all made in London, so ethical fashion mm. was very much her thing. So it affected um, all six of you? In some way, I reckon, yeah. I don't know where the, uh, the boys are. Um, so yeah. you then came back to England, and yeah. uh, I remember Danny Cohen actually telling me this story oh, about yeah. how one of the things that stood out to him was not only your talent, your obvious talent on screen, <laughs> your, obviously, your obvious naturalness on screen, but also the fact that you really cared, and you really took it to heart, and you beyond the programme, became involved in campaigning for ethical clothing and, and fair trade and so on. So what, yeah. tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm definitely no saint and I'm far from perfect and, you know, there's... Um, yeah, I don't want it to sound like, you know, I kind of found myself and I've never put a foot wrong ever since. But I India, just Well, yourself. that's it, yeah, <laughs> like one of them NAF movies. Um, but I just, I, just, I just felt, you know, I didn't, I didn't realise that there were people living like that. And then when, I, when it did become apparent and when it was clear, I thought, actually, that, that's just, just, just so unfair. And because we're buying the clothes that they're making, surely we have a certain level of responsibility to, to kick off and to make sure that people know how these people are being treated. So I, I just thought, like, transparency was necessary and, you know, I was just writing to, to clothes stores that I was shopping th from and saying, you know, I've just learned X, Y, and Z. You know, how do you feel about this? It'd be great to hear, you know who makes your clothes and where you stand on these on these points. Um, was this before the series had aired? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And did you continue to write to them after the series was aired? Yeah, then I wrote again was a couple of times. Of course, yeah, because you've been on the telly and, you know, the BBC. <laughs> <gasps> so people listen far more. Um, we did Newsnight, actually, as well, which was so surreal because, you know, as you can see, I was just a 20-year-old with no experience whatsoever. No, not a journalist, not a politician, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, and I remember ringing my mum and saying, oh, they've asked me to go on news night, and her just being like, what? Like, <laughs> there's just no way you can do it. Like, they'll tear, they'll tear you to pieces. Like, have you ever watched it? I was like, no, but, you know, they just want to talk about <laughs> what I learned in India. How hard can it be? Like, I was there. Um, and actually, perhaps it was a dream. I've got to say, it was very, very kind to me. Um, yeah. And then it just continued. You know, I just... Um, I was campaigning, was doing a bit of fundraising, and then I got my own two 60-minute series, and it rated well. You know, people either really took to me or really despised me. There was no <laughs> in-between, which is perfect. You're Bovril. Yeah, yeah, your mama. Yeah, because you never want to be vanilla, but I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, some people were thinking, who on earth is she, and has Danny Cohen lost his mind? <laughs> and other people saying, this is really refreshing, she's not wearing beige chinos, you know, just because... <laughs> You don't talk a certain way or you're not from a certain section of society doesn't mean that you don't have an opinion and you don't care. So mm. we broke barriers in some respects in that sense, I think, mm. maybe. Yeah, I think for the BBC at the time, it was yeah. very refreshing not to have middle-class, middle-aged We've seen it. We've seen that for such a long time and there's certainly a space for it. But it's like, it's like everything. We don't all listen to... There's not one genre of music or one type of movie. You know, there's, there's definitely space. There's room for different styles and different tones, especially with documentaries, 100%.
<coughs> so we're going to we're going to nip whip on a bit okay. to 2012. Okay. Um, so you're getting into your, getting into your pace a bit more here. Yeah, fine. We're going to look flow. at uh, we're going to look at a clip from Girls Behind Bars. Oh, I like this one. So just tell us about this clip. Yeah, no, this this is really interesting. I don't know what clip it is. What clip is it? It's the. But I like the. the film. Well, you'll see in a minute. Well, yeah. What, but this, yeah, we'll watch it and then we'll, we'll talk. watch the clip and okay. then we'll talk about it. Let's have the next clip, please. She was amazing. I really, really liked her. So the whole film. It was fairly straightforward. We were just looking at, um, we were comparing two different types of prisons and seeing, you know, what the benefits were and, and vice versa. And one of them was in Manhattan, so it was like a typical traditional standard jail. And the other one was like boot camps. So it was the idea that rehabilitation was key and there was a lot more emphasis placed on that. And um, I just grew so fond of some of the girls. Like some of them were a nightmare and some of them, you know, had done really horrific things, but some of them, like Brown, were just really unlucky, like wrong place, wrong time, didn't have great guidance, just a bit lost, a bit conf you know, just, just needed a hand. And actually, after this, after we filmed this, she came up to me and she just burst in tears. She was holding my hands and she was just like, you've just been such a trooper, like you've just been such a good mate, blah, 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 blah. And I'd only known her like a week and a half, so it just mm. goes to show how kind of desperate she was to have mm. a pal. Um, I really liked that film. It, it, it was um, quite immersive and... It was nice to be in the one place for a couple of weeks and really soak it all up and kind of, yeah. And how much were you involved? You were talking earlier <coughs> on about the, the, the doing the APing now and yeah. setting it all up. Was that one, was that, these no. were presumably the days where you just turned up? Exactly, yeah. No, that's exactly it. The lady who made that, a girl called Wendy, she's a dream actually, um, she would kind of brief me and, and she would say, who do you want to spend time with? What do you find interesting? What do you want to learn from this? And so it was great that they still gave me, you know, freedom then um, and that's why I gravitated to Bran and there was a couple of other girls as well that um, I really kicked it off with but yeah far less involved editorially 100% and in terms of the subject matter obviously you're associated with you know women's rights yeah. women's issues and that kind of thing is that a choice you've made or is that the channel kind of going oh Stacey does that so you no, know, do, do you more know, of those no it's, it's, it's been quite an organic process it's just naturally what's what's happened and what I'm most interested in um, the channel are brilliant, I've got to say, you know, my, my bosses are, they, they give me such freedom and, and they say, what is it that you fancy doing? We've had, you know, a couple of proposals in, what, what makes you tick? And, you know, the one that's just been commissioned, um, we're heading over to Russia. And that's something that I'm desperate to do because they've passed this ridiculous law where essentially this, this woman, this woman has come out and said that it's not worth breaking families over a slap. Um, so there's been a sort of change in the law looking at domestic violence so now you can only press charges if you've broken bones or you've been hospitalized so you know these things just infuriate me and I think you know as a privileged woman who who lives in a place where I'm able you know freedom of speech is is a priority and I just think you, you have to surely fight for the girls that can't defend themselves always um, and it's just what makes me tick so yeah the last few have been like that but yeah it's not a conscious decision it's just and when you, when you, you know, if you're in Russia and you meet a woman who's in a controlling relationship but hasn't had a bone broken, mm. does it make you angry? 100%. And I've had to learn, actually, because there's been a couple of times where I've kicked off or I've kind of overstepped the line. Like, Luton's a perfect example. I'm sort of face-to-face we'll to to face shouting yeah. and bowling with this, with this man. And it's a tricky balance because you don't want to lose yourself and you don't want to turn into a nodding dog with no opinion or no thoughts or no bite. But you also have to allow them to say how they feel. And, you know, you, you, you can't kind of go around telling people how they should behave and what they should do because it might be that she genuinely believes she wants to stay. And so you, you have to learn how to be... Um, more accommodating and more understanding and less judgmental. And I feel like I've become a lot less judgmental as, as the years have passed. So the, the, we don't have this. We'll, we'll go on to Luton in, in one second. Okay. But, um, you just <laughs> reminded me of yeah. uh, a film that you made with, with True Vision, which was in, also in Russia. Yes. And <laughs> you interviewed a... a, a, a it's a lovely a, man. Yeah, delightful man, a chap called Milanov. Milanov. Who, who was a local MP who... Um, Putin sort of... Protégé. Putin's poodle. Yeah, yeah. Putin's poodle. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
And you got really quite angry with him. Because yeah. he was basically saying, you know, prostitutes are... Scumbags. Scum, they're, He's no, based, they're no yeah. better than murderers. And he was just a moron. You know, some people, you've, <laughs> some people you really try to see eye to eye, but some people you just have to call a spade a spade. This guy was such an unkind, militant idiot, in my opinion. Um, and actually, me and the director had a bit of a to-do yeah. after that because I refused to shake his hand. And he said, that's really unprofessional. And I said, well, I don't know what to say. This isn't Radio 4, and I'm not going to be forced to do something that I don't want to do. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and actually, I think David now, if, if you speak to him, he'll, he'll yeah. agree that I got that right because there's nothing I agreed with him on. So, so you came back from that trip. The two of you came back from that trip. David was the director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Film, and... <laughs> Uh, he and he said to me, "Oh, we had this disastrous interview with Milanoff, and it's the best interview Stacey in there was too. completely unprofessional and got really angry with him, and you know, walked out without shaking his hand." And and I was thinking, "Sounds great. Sounds <laughs> like <laughs> sounds like great telly." And, and I said, "We'll cut it together." And he said, "No, we can't use it. We can't use it." And yeah. I said, no, "Cut it together and let me see." <coughs> and we, he cut it together and showed me. Um, and what well, I think uh, you're right now, David would see that. David had come from Channel 4 News and, you know, he was, from a, straight, he was from a news background. You're, an in, you're, a, you're a professional journalist and you're trying to extract someone's views. Yeah. And what he didn't get was that wasn't what BBC Three wants. What BBC Three just, viewers want they is... They just want honesty. They want you to, be, you, you to be you. You just have to be honest. You, honesty, you just have to be You just have to be honest. You know, factually correct. You know, accuracy is key, of course. You know, they're brilliant docs that they make, but... No one wants to see you shaking hands with somebody who you, who you don't agree with or somebody who you don't believe in. Nobody likes to be told what to do either. You know, it's, we've seen that from you know, the, the election just gone. It's, it's old school, man. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not necessary all of the time. Milenov. So what we're going to do now is so we're going to have a look at a film called Hometown Fanatics now. So yes. you'd become... This, this is 2012... So you'd sort of done I five years of God. mostly international films. You'd been all over the world. You'd gone. You had, actually hadn't done much in the UK no, at that point. No, I pitched you? this. This was my first one. Brilliant. Yeah, no, it was great. So why did you pitch it? What? So I went. So I went into BBC Three, and because I had a unique relationship, because I, I do have a, a relationship with the lead, or I did have a relationship with the leader of the EDL. We grew up together. We went to, you know, we grew up in the same area. Um, when he wasn't part of the EDL, and I also had a relationship with the leader of the Almohad Jerome. Again, a lot of them were in our school. So at school, this is what's so bizarre. We were all fine at school, and then as soon as we left college, everyone just sort of went their opposite ways, and then it was like we were living in parallel universes. So I just thought it would be really interesting Dr. May, and I felt like I had the authority to do it because it's my town. And they said, yeah, so that, that was handy. <laughs> I was so angry. <laughs> so I look like I want to go to Milanoff's office. <laughs> so, yeah, you say you were very angry. We were talking a minute ago, you were talking about becoming angry. Do you yeah. think you would handle that differently yes. today? Yes, yes, I do you think I would probably. Now? But do you know what? You, you still have to stand for something, and you still have to pull people up when you think they're, they're being unreasonable and extreme. I mean, the lad directly behind me is in prison now. Um, and he went to school just down the road from me. So tensions, you know, everybody there that day felt absolutely certain that they were right, you know, and anybody who opposed them were just categorically wrong. And I think I would have probably been a lot calmer um, and sort of held it together a bit better. But I think it, I felt quite attacked, you know. There were, like, far more of, of them than, than there were of me. You know, I was on my own and I had one lady shooting and so I felt like shit I've got, I've got to fight my corner here because if I don't they'll just tear me to pieces and because we all knew each other anyway we grew up for years so I was seeing people that we were okay you know you and I were okay five years ago and now you're not standing up and saying oh be reasonable be fair so it was, it was very emotional for me and you know it's your home and so when you see people not getting on your gutted you think oh, I wish we could I wish we could make this work I wish we could put it right um, but you learn, you know, that, that was six year, five, six years ago. And, you know, nobody starts, starts off perfect. I'm far from perfect now. I've still got so much to learn and a long, long way to go. Um, but it's like any job, you know, any craft. You, you know, you, you make mistakes, you fall over, and you think, oh, fuck, I won't do that again. Or you, you watch directors and you think, I really like how she speaks to people. I'm, I'm less keen on kind of that. And so as the years go by, you hopefully improve. 
So in that situation, you've got the, the woman telling you to put some clothes yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've got... Them I the, felt like the I was quite modestly dressed, though, because I'd just come from... Um, I'd been two really sweet girls, Muslim girls, we'd just been around their house eating, and that march, you know, it, it wasn't scheduled at all. We just bumped into it, and that's why in one of the shots you can see the radio mics in my hand, because I'd taken it off to go for a wee. I didn't know we were about to film this. And then it all just materialised, and so we followed the actuality. And so I had already kind of consciously covered my, my shoulders because I was in their folks' house, and, you know, you just want to... You want to be respectful. Um, so I actually, it was really hot. And I was thinking, do you know what, girl, in all honesty, if, it, if I hadn't been filming what I had this morning, I'd have a vest and shorts on. And that's, that's, my proc that's my choice. That's my business in the same way. I totally respect that you are absolutely well within your rights to wear whatever you want to wear. Um, perhaps so I should have articulated that slightly yeah, better. So she's, saying, she's telling you that you're naked. And then, yeah. then the, 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 the guy comes along. He's, he's the one that really annoyed me. Because yeah. I thought, listen, her and I are having this conversation. She clearly isn't shy. You know, she's happy to, to say what it is that she wants to say. Why have you come and got involved? And they were like a pack of wolves then, man. I just think, you know, they were much, much older, much bigger. There were loads of them. I just thought, actually... No, I'm not having it. And that's where you can see the kind of loot and comes out of me. Don't start. <laughs> <laughs> um. So they were being pretty provocative. How do you yeah. think you would respond now that's different? Um, I try not to shout. <laughs> I try not to raise my voice. And I would try and truly understand. But no, I think I did even then. You, you try and truly understand where they're coming from. Because in this line of work, you meet people who are so far away from where you are that you have to try and see it from their point of view, else you're like that the entire time. You know, if I speak to child abusers or, you know, paedophiles or drug cartels, we, we have very little in common. So, so you have to try and come round to their side and say, explain it to me. I'm trying to be open-minded. Tell me what it's like to, to walk in your shoes. So... So Sorry, I'm just laughing there, because yeah. so, so few people you can have a conversation with who can say, yeah, when I speak to paedophiles yeah. and child <laughs> yeah. abusers and drug cartels. And I know. <laughs> yeah, well, there has to be a certain... You have to try and, yeah, you have to try and understand what their lives are like and, and, and who they really are um, and just try and keep calm. And I think I, I definitely have done that. And given that you now speak to paedophiles yeah. and sex abusers and yeah. drug cartels uh -huh. and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, do you sometimes just pinch yourself and go, is this really my life? Yeah, 100%. Oh, my God. It's so bizarre, isn't it? Sometimes when we're, you know, me and the director, you know, she'll be briefing me about what it is that she thinks interesting and, you know, we'll be going through what questions we should be asking. You hear yourself and then it's like an out-of-body experience. You suddenly think, my God, this is so surreal but also such a privilege like I really honestly but I do believe that you know I I could be somewhere very different at, at this point and I'm not and I never ever ever take that for granted even if I've got the arm or you've got the shit or you've been working 17 hours or you're tired or your boyfriend's got the arm because you haven't been home in four months <laughs> you to, to be to be able to go into somebody else's world and them allow you in and you to do that for a living is like, what the heck, what else would I want to do? You know what I mean? What, what else, what is better than that? So in this case, you were in Luton, which is, yes. you know, as it says, more hometown. your hometown. Yeah. Which is, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's in a way, it's much simpler and cleaner mm. to go to Honduras yeah. or, you know, for the Philippines or whatever yeah. and go in and, you blah, know, blah, you blah. can then confront the drug cartel or yeah. the trafficker or whatever it is. Yeah. You're in your hometown now. That's were you worried about that? That's where it was quite tricky because there were repercussions. So, yeah, sort of predictably, I'd upset both sides, which mm. is good. It means, you know, you've, <laughs> you've done your job to a certain extent. Um, but, but once it had TX, once it had aired, it all got... Because it was so close to home, it all got a bit messy. And, you know, my mother was working in m and at the time, um, in the Arndale. And I was getting phone calls from my mum, and it was like the newspapers had kind of gone into m and and asked my mum, you know, um, if she was an EDL sympathiser or if she was a, you know, terrorist sympathiser. You know, it was bringing my family into it, and there were cars outside the house, and it, it got silly. You know, I was walking down to the train station, and people were calling me an EDL whore, or an Alma Hadjarin slag. So it was like you, you just couldn't win. And, and that's the thing. So many people, there's so much tension there that it does warrant a film and you need to go in and say, what, what on earth is going on? 
But it's also, yeah, inevitably, afterwards, people are so outraged. They become so vocal, which is what you want to do, I suppose, with documentaries. You, you want people to, to feel something and to react. But, yeah, it was harder. Yeah, it was. And how, how active was social media at that point? Were you, I mean, were you getting a lot of slagging off on social oh, media? Oh, yeah, it? all the time. And it's, it's so funny because some, some of the trolls are so detailed. <laughs> it was like, um, you, you loot and whore. Um, I'm sorry if anybody's under 16 in here. Um, you, you loot and no, you loot and whore. Um, I can imagine you in 10 years' time um, with a buggy, with a kid hanging onto the buggy, dragging it across the road, shouting at everyone you come across. I was thinking, who's got the time to write such a detailed <laughs> tweet? Um, but that's something that just comes with a job, and you can't. You have to sort of grow thick skin. And and when I when I very first started, I was 20. You know, I so cared about what people thought, and I'm so gutted if people said, oh, "I don't rate her," or you know, she's what on earth is she doing? I was so genuinely wanting to write back, going, "Oh no, you've got it wrong." X Y Z. Actually, now I honestly, hands on heart. Some of them I find quite funny, and I send them to my friends, and I'm like, oh, my God, look at this guy. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just part and parcel of it, isn't it? Have you been threatened on social media? Yeah, loads of times. I just, I just block them. They say you should go to the police, but who's got the time? <laughs> no, just staying on. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. Sometimes I bite back, and I think, oh, don't. And then I think, oh, I wish I hadn't, because <laughs> I've given them their two minutes, but... So the other thing that with this one is that this this particular film, Hometown Fanatics, was massive on YouTube, wasn't it? it Huge. Was viewed. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of times. Millions. Millions. Yeah. Of times. We we were getting phone calls because it is such a point. You know, because so many people have an opinion on this particular subject, one way or another. We were getting calls from Australia and America. Right wing organisations were kind of trimming that that clip down, and so you know they were often jumping on that. Um, it was a really chaotic couple of months after that. Um, and that, has that affected your... Uh, how, how does that affect you in terms of working now, thinking about going into, you know, southern Turkey or northern Iraq or places where near, near where ISIS might be, given that some of these people... Have, I mean, there have been some people from Luton... Yeah, I mean, that, that, that guy um, behind me, I don't know if you saw him, he's a big ginger lad, and I think he went to Putridge, I went to Stopsley, but they're not very far at all, but he's in prison now. Um, and a few other boys that I know from Luton are now in, in prison, and, and some of them have died, they, they were killed in Syria. Um, so it is, it is very... It's all very close, it's, it's, it's very real. And um, So when I was in northern Iraq and when I was in southern Turkey, and I knew that there were... Uh, ISIS cells, perhaps nearby. You do, you know, your, your sort of head runs away with you a little bit because you think, oh my God, I don't want anybody at home to know where I am because then it might get back to X and he might have a contact here. And So it, it sounds a bit over the top, but you just have to be um, quite switched on and make sure that, you know, nobody knows your movements or where you're going or who you're going to be with because you don't want to jeopardise other people either. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Never a we'll, get moment on, we'll get on to some dangerous stuff in a minute. <laughs> so, um, next clip is World's Worst Place to Be a Woman. Honduras, from, yeah. From 2015. Um, so, tell us about this clip. Heidi. Heidi was a total dream. So, Heidi, so Honduras, we were there essentially because it had become the most dangerous place to be a woman at that time. So, the femicide rate was sky high. There were more women dying in Honduras than anywhere else in the world being murdered. And the levels of brutality in Honduras were just so harrowing, like, really quite shocking and the way that these girls were being murdered um, was so inhumane and so we went over there to, to try and understand why and you know the, the kind of the factors that were involved um, and I met a girl called Heidi and a month prior to, to this conversation that we're about to watch she'd had both her legs macheted off um, because her her husband was incredibly violent. He always had been, and, you know, domestic violence had always been prevalent in her life. And she, she thought one day, she went, you know, I've had enough, actually, I'm not doing this anymore, I'm leaving you. And he turned around and said to her, well, you can't leave if you've got no legs. So he, in front of their kids, and the kids were tiny, so he sawed off her legs. I mean, it's a total miracle she lived. It's a total um, blessing that she survived, and... It was just so sad because she was so young, same age as me, so beautiful, so kind, so much to live for. 
but for obvious reasons, just now found herself in a complete shit situation. Do you know what happened? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so he, he, didn't, he didn't get 40 years. Um, I, don't, I actually think he's out now. Um, Paisley's still struggling because it's, it's tricky. You can't... We were toying with the idea of perhaps trying to get the prosthetic legs. Mm -hmm. um, but there's even, there's even an issue with that because it's in Honduras and you know, we were trying to think if we could raise the money. But there's so many, there's so many complications that, you know, that for one reason or another, they, they said no, they didn't want that. Um, so she's still in her chair. Her kids are doing well. Um, but what's so mental is that so there are so many Heidi's. I know people often say that, but there are so, so many women who are just in an impossible situation because there was one refuge, there was one refuge that we went to visit and um, there was loads of really vulnerable women in there and, you know, they they'd plucked up the courage to leave and they felt like this was their haven. And then the guys sent men in with shotguns and, um, you know, they, were, they had all their balaclavas on and they just, shot, they just shot all of these... They were shooting in the refuge and so these girls fled the refuge and never came back. So now they're in a situation where they've, they've literally got nowhere to go, nowhere. Mm. So, yeah. So you're, you're going around the world. You've made 80-odd films. You've yeah. met a lot of Heidi's. Yeah. Not exactly the same as Heidi, but many people who've... Who, who terrible, terrible things have happened yeah. to. When people watch your films, sometimes they tweet about how traumatising they, they, yeah. they find the experience of watching it. It must be a thousand times more traumatising for you being there and doing this week in, week out, keeping seeing it. How do you cope do with I that? Do I stay sane? Yeah. <laughs> um, people often ask this. I... I think I can't really spend too much time worrying about how, how it makes me feel because clearly I am so lucky and I'm so privileged and I'm so fortunate. It's, it's these girls that, that you really feel for. And like when I was in northern Iraq back into last year with these Yazidi girls, I mean, the, the, the things that these girls have been through, I haven't even seen it in a horror movie. Like, you know, some of the girls talk about, talked about these, these individuals cutting up their babies and making them... I mean, just next level kind of horrific, barbaric um, situations. And so you, you feel for them and then you want to be there so that they feel comfortable and they will really open up and they feel like they've got the platform that they wouldn't have if, if we weren't there. And then you go home, have a bit of a cry, whatever, and then just pick yourself up. But you have to focus on the fact that in these harrowing circumstances, there are always really amazing people either, you know, that belong to an NGO or individuals themselves who try and make the bad things good and you know the wrong things right and I know that sounds very Miss World but it's true and I do like fundamentally believe like in, in the grand scheme of things there are more goodies than baddies it's just the baddies are so shocking and so evil that that warrants attention because you need to know that, that this is going on. But still, I'm going to pursue this. Yeah. You're there and you're hearing those Yazidi girls talking about having their babies chopped up and being forced to eat them or whatever. Yeah. And that is traumatising you. Yeah, so how do it's you, not... Because, yeah, I, of course, it's, no, it's nowhere near the trauma yeah. they've gone through. But it's still traumatising you. Yeah. And how do you keep that... How do you find that balance that means you've got time to I can to go back home and with it? Yeah, be normal again. Um, I'm really lucky because, like, my director, the directors that I work with, we're pals now. You know, you tend to have four or five that you feel comfy with. And, you know, at the end, I mean, Iraq's a perfect example. I was with a girl called Almadina and another girl um, called Helen. And they're both such troopers, like, complete stars, so talented. Helen's only young. Almu's really established. And we're like sisters. You know, when you're on location, we were sleeping on the roof for two weeks. You don't wash, you don't eat, you don't brush your teeth, you share the same hairbrush. And so at the end of a really um, deep conversation, you'll go away, have a bottle of water and just say, how are you feeling? You just keep an eye on everyone. You get everything out that you're worried about or you're panicking about and then you kick on. But it does, it does sometimes take a few days or a few weeks to adjust. Like, when we were in the Philippines, Marta and I, I don't know where Marta is, but Marta and I were in the Philippines and some of the stuff we heard in the Philippines, you know, you're, you're talking about two-year-old children being abused in their sleep and... Um, it's exhausting sometimes because you walk away and you're just, it's literally like you've been hit by a bus. You just think that was just so intense and so full on. Or 
I so feel for you, but feeling for you isn't enough. So, you know, we've got to make sure that this is a really awesome doc and people are made aware of this. Um, but, yeah, you have, you know, you have a cry, there are tears, and you make sure the girls around you are okay, and then you kick on. Uh, but if, if, if it ever got to a point where I felt like it was all-consuming or I couldn't go back to my normal life, I, I would have no issues with, you know, speaking to somebody and the channel, you have know, you my boss. That? No, you not just yet. I haven't felt like it's necessary, but my boss always says, you know, Stace, there's a number there. If, if you need to talk, you don't even need to tell me that's the number. You can come. We're here if you need us. Um, there was only one time where I was... I found it really hard to shake off when I saw my first dead body, actually, and the girl was only a couple of years older than me, and I remember her, all of her belongings were next to her. It was in the, in the Sonora Desert she was found. She was trying to cross over into the States to work. And this sounds like a really detailed um, description, but she had like a hairband and like still, still bits of her hair were in the hairband. And that's just something that I have in my house all the time. Cause all my hair, you know. So there was that. I know it sounds really ridiculous, but that was something that I could really relate to. And I was thinking, my God, this is just, just another girl and she's died because she needed to come here to work. And I couldn't stop seeing that for a couple of weeks. But then slowly, slowly, it, it was fine. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah, it can be tricky sometimes. And the, you talked about <coughs> I think you're absolutely right about you know there are more good people than bad people, yeah. but the bad people get get more attention. Yeah. Um, who's the worst person you feel you've met, <laughs> interviewed? The most evil bastard you've ever Brian. Come yeah. Yeah, Brian Woods. <laughs> um, um there, there, have been, there have been times where, when I was in Mexico, there, there were times when you heard what the drug dealers had done that you couldn't comprehend and you couldn't understand. I mean, you, you get that there will always be issues and, you know, the war on drugs has failed spectacularly and I do think we need to look at that in a different way. But you understand men fighting men and, you know, the, the kind of gangs who have chosen to become part of this world kind of clashing... But when they start dragging the kids into it, I find that very difficult. And similarly, like, you know, ISIS as a movement at the minute, the, the things that they are seemingly willing to do to some of these innocent women and babies, I find I can't, I can't get in that space. I can't understand and in any way. And have you met any of those? Have you talked to any of those drug dealers or any of those ISIS fighters who who you believe have done these kind of things? Have you sat opposite them? I've, yeah. Do you know, no, I haven't, I haven't sat opposite. I mean, there was, there was a um, proposal, actually, for me to go and interview some of these ISIS men that had raped these Yazidi women that I spent time with, which I would be really keen to do. Um, but I've met some of the, the dealers, you know, in, in Mexico and some of the, the cartels. And for them, it just pure, it, it is business. It's as simple as that. And it's so bizarre because they go to church every Sunday and they really respect the Father. And, you know, so they do understand that morals are a thing that exist. But for them, it's just, it's, it's straight business. I met a guy in Honduras, actually, who, after I had interviewed Hyde, I went and met, met this guy called Homer who was in prison for cutting his wife's head off because she was speaking to a guy at work. And I just remember saying, try, trying to say to him, like, machismo is such a huge thing there, and actually you get a lesser sentence if you say it was a crime of passion. It was like I couldn't... I loved her so much, you know, it took control of me. I had, I, I had no self-control. Um, and for him, it was very black and white. It was like, well, she shouldn't have done it. If she hadn't have spoken to that guy, I wouldn't have done that. So sometimes you just have to accept that you can't, you can't get to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned uh, the Yazidi girls film. Yes. Um, this is an extraordinary piece we're about to see. Yes, where they're amazing. These girls are so amazing. I can't begin to tell you how brave they are and how admirable and how kind and so soft. Imagine, like, imagine going through what they've been through and still being a kind person. They're just awesome. Ola Garen. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Ola Garen. Uh -huh. So, uh, I guess you were quite frightened. I was so frightened. And, that's, and, and do you know what? You know, I think some people would have kicked off and said, oh, don't, don't leave that in. You know, I want to look <laughs> like I'm really together and, you know, I'm so professional. 
But I wasn't. That, that is honestly what happened. I was so frightened, and I think any normal girl like me would be sort of a kilometre and a half away from ISIS. I mean, they had been so active that morning. Um, <clears throat> but these girls, you know, I was only with these girls for two weeks, and that had been their reality for two years. So mm. for me to say, actually, do you know what? I'm just going to stay here. You kick on, and then join me when you're further away. That you, you can't do that, especially they'd been so accommodating, and they'd really allowed us in, and they were so tactile, you know, doing me hair, and we were just pally. We were friends. Um, so yeah, once you become part of the gang, you can't really, <laughs> you can't really dodge it when, when they're going to work. Um, but it was really, really terrifying. Actually, that gig, I didn't tell my mum. I told her I was in Turkey because I thought she would just lose her mind. She would just not sleep for two weeks. And so when I came out, and I, I was genuinely quite frightened before I remember packing to, to go here and I'd had a couple of conversations with Jackie and I was desperate to do it and I felt like these girls were so, so amazing. You know, we've got to show that they exist. So many people didn't even know their story. Um, but there was a nagging part of me thinking, I don't want to die. So I was like packing the case and I started crying. My boyfriend's like, what's wrong with you? I was like, I don't want to go. I've changed my mind. He said, you've got to go. He said, if you don't go, you will regret it forever. And it's the best piece of advice he's ever given me. Um, yeah. Is that the most frightened you've been filming? Yeah. 100%. And I remember like driving down, so Sinja was so beautiful. The girls were showing me pictures of it before it was bombed on their phones. It was so beautiful, it's like bustling markets. And we were driving through just total devastation. Um, and to be there and, and, and to see it firsthand and to smell it. And I could smell something. And I was saying, what, what on earth is that smell? And the girls said, there's a, dead, there's a dead fighter behind that door. So to be that close to the reality... Um, was breathtaking, really. Yeah. It's weird. When I came, like, when I landed, so it was, you know, a very long journey, and then we flew back from Erbil, safe in Erbil. We went to Erbil, and we flew to Istanbul. As soon as I landed in Istanbul, I can't tell you, but I felt such, like, relief. It was like you exhale, and I thought, I'm never going to take for granted what a luxury it is to not be frightened all of the time. <coughs> Like the girl, you know, the kids living in Syria and, you know, the people that are living in really tricky situations at the minute. To, 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 be, a, to be scared 24 hours a day is so exhausting. And so, yeah, I just remember thinking, God, I must, must enjoy feeling like this. So when you're making a film like that, you're yeah. in <coughs> uh, under very close proximity, you're working with with people, you're effectively, you know, you're, be, you're becoming friends with them. Yeah. Because that's sort of what you need to yeah. do as, 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 as a presenter to build that relationship. But on the other hand, you're doing that dozens of times a year. So yeah. you can't maintain relationships with all of those people no, afterwards. No, and you don't. <coughs> you do don't. You, do you keep up with any of them? Yeah. There's, there's, I would say there's probably 10 or 20 people that I... I'm still in contact with now. There's a family in Chicago that I got really close with. We, it's so hard. It's so easy as well now with like Twitter and you know WhatsApp or whatever. So you know it's not every day, but you know we'll, we'll touch base every couple of weeks. They'll tell me how they're doing if it's someone's birthday. We still speak to the girls, um, and actually that's why there's this idea of perhaps going back and speaking to to the men who did this to them. Um, I try and keep the, the relationship going for as long as they want to because, you know, they've allowed me into their lives. And so for me to go, I'll see you later. <laughs> I'm off now, but good luck. It's, yeah. it's, it's not fair. It's just, yeah, it's bizarre who, who's in your phone book. Like, I just <laughs> got back from Glasgow. We were filming with a load of heroin um, dealers. And it, it kind of, um, it tests you as a person because you want to stand up for what you believe in and for what's right but you also don't want to be too judgmental and you need to understand that everybody's story is different. So I was having a conversation with them this morning, actually, about something else. So, yeah. <laughs> Chatting to your dealers. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ch the thing is, Brian, I'm so un-rock and roll. Like, people always tweet me like, oh, did you try, you know, d did you try any other goods? I'm like, I don't even drink. So it's, <laughs> it's totally wasted on me, anything like that. I just, yeah, in and out. <coughs> So we're going to have one more clip, okay. and then we're going to open. We'll, we'll bring the house lights up afterwards, or we'll have one more clip. We'll have a chat about that. Then we'll bring the house lights up, and it's your turn to to ask Stacey some questions. Okay, so I feel like Britney think Spears. Of some I've questions. had this on, and there's been like all these lights, and I can't see anyone. 
<laughs> I literally feel like, yeah, BS, but it's good. <laughs> So this is um, from uh, oh, yeah. this is pretty much the most recent did. film, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, with 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 Marta. With Marta. Um, this is about the Philippines, and it's an extraordinary film that is. I uh, I mean, I've made quite a lot of fairly dark documentaries yeah. over the years, and I have to say, when I first saw the rough cut of this, I was shocked. I was like, "Whoa, that is pretty hardcore stuff." Mm. Um, this came about because of a previous film you made, and yep. then you and the director Joyce met this chap who's an undercover uh, officer for, for Homeland Security, yep. and has been posing as a paedophile yep. for the last two years to, to infiltrate a paedophile ring. Yep. And you just main, you and Joyce just maintained relations with him, and yeah, then he said, okay, you can film my next operation. Yeah, we had met him years ago, but yeah, we, we felt like there was another film there, and so we kept, yeah, as you say, we kept in contact, and um, he was he was so kind to allow us in actually because it was such intense work and yeah it was really worthwhile. I mean that clip's gone viral. Like I think it's been watched online like 18 million times or mm. something mental like that. So when people say you know young people aren't interested in documentaries or current affairs, it's utter nonsense because yeah 18 million cl in, in like a week or something yeah. mad like that. I remember writing. I, I wrote an email to you and the head of the channel uh, and and the commissioning editor and the, and the director saying someone's just sent me this on Facebook and it's been watched, and this was like the, the day the film had come out, it's been watched 1.7 million That's times. Crazy, isn't it? And yeah. as I was typing <coughs> the email, you know, someone else came and asked me something and I talked to them for a couple of minutes. And then I got to the end of the email and I just clicked back on Facebook and it was now 1.9 million times. It's, mental, you know, it's yeah. just sort of exponential, the, the extraordinary way that The appetite's the way it definitely there, yeah. More and more, so, more, now more than ever, I would say. I think what's really interesting, seeing the, f the five clips, the six <laughs> clips, the six clips we've looked at yeah. just now, <coughs> is in a way, in that one, there's, there's a lot going on. Yeah. You know, you're angry, mm -hmm. you're upset, you're also delivering director camera really articulate thoughts about the situation. You're then finishing that thought and leaving frame. <laughs> um, you're... It's you can see how much you've come on, as it were. As it were, you know, you can see that that's ten years later. Yeah. Than, than, than Christ, can you imagine if it was the other way around? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, where do you where? How do you see that progressing? You know, where where how, where do you want to? In ten years' time, what's the difference? Ah, what, um, what, what do you want to? How do you want to appear? I just want. Do you know what? You're, you're absolutely right. I think, and as I sort of touched on earlier, you know, with every. With every career, with you know, Matt, no matter what you do for a living, you you learn and you grow, and hopefully, you know, if you're doing it right, you become better and better, or stronger and stronger as the years go on. Um, but there's still so much for for me to learn. Like I still don't know how to shoot a camera properly, and um, I still wouldn't be able to direct anything. There's still there's still a lot that I need to improve on, and so hopefully, you know, if I continue to get the work, and you know, they rate consistently well. If people continue to watch them, then you just want more of the same, I suppose. You want to you want to make sure that you're giving the people that wouldn't necessarily have a voice otherwise a platform and make documentaries that people are thinking, my goodness, I didn't know enough about this and now I do, I feel a certain way and I'm going to go on to raise awareness or I'm going to sort of investigate further. Um, yeah, I think I would like to continue in that way. And on the one hand, I mean, one of the interesting things is that, you know, people are saying the election was swung by the young. Yeah. And they're getting engaged. They, you know, the young people 100%. got engaged for the first time. Yeah. And on the one hand, you see at the moment across television, Channel 4, BBC One, BBC Two, they're doing fewer and fewer international programmes. Mm -hmm. Actually, on BBC Three, with you and mm -hmm. with one or two of the other presenters, there's an awful lot of international stuff. Mm. So do you think... Uh, on the one hand, people say, oh, it's got to... I remember a few years ago, people saying, oh, it's got to be two minutes long. You know, young people haven't got an attention span. Yeah. I mean, and, and that was honestly the conversations that you'd have to entertain. You'd be sat around a table with middle-aged, middle-class men, like you said. Like me. Who, like you, Brian. <laughs> it's true. But yeah, you're, you're not a typical... You're not a typical <laughs> middle-aged man. Um, but, you, you know, you'd be sitting around these tables and they'd be scratching their heads. Honestly, like we were a different species, going... 
how are we going to engage, you know, how are we going to make it so that we're able to kind of <coughs> allow youngsters to, to watch our documentaries and it's got to be really pacey and there's got to be loads of um, fast-paced music and, you know, there's got to be um, loads of colour and it's got to be really jazzy and you would just literally be sliding into the chair thinking, I don't think that's the way forward. And I think that's where the channel have done so well. You know, it's, it's not preachy and it's not condescending. It's just very honest, you know, uh, some of them are authored pieces and, like, the Queer Britain's brilliant. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's this young lad who has a genuine opinion and, you know, they're just going out and trying to find out things for themselves. And people are... People are interested in watching that, I think. Um, and that's why Three's doing so well. Like, we won Channel of the Year. Um, it's not constraint, you know, it's not... They don't try and kind of fit us into this weird kind of pigeonhole. Because we're online, we, we've got so much more freedom. It's awesome. I'm very, very happy at the minute. Yeah. Good. Let's... Can we bring the house lights up um, so we can see? Because I can't see anybody. That's yeah. better. My God, so busy. I'm got, so delighted. So so I hope someone light. comes. Yeah. <laughs> My mother and your girlfriend. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it's packed. Sold out. I think. Pretty sure it was. Um. So, have we got any? Any? Who? Who wants to? Yes, this lady here. Can we? Hi. Um, Hello. My name is Beatrice, and this is my best friend, Abby. Hello. <laughs> um, we're yeah, we're two sixth form students from Kent. Um, we've we, we we've like fallen in love over the past year with learning from other people's cultures, other people's experiences, and. You and your documentaries had a big part to play in that, and we come from an all-girls school, and we've, yeah, we've like amongst our peer groups, we've spread news about your documentaries, and like it's like sparked up debates amongst our social groups, talking about everything that you've experienced. Um, and another like way we've come to love learning about cultures, we do anthropology. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so we've been learning about a drug gang in New York. Um, that's like what we've been studying this year. And obviously, learning in the classroom is very different to like your job, being out, experiencing, talking to real people. So I was just wondering, what advice could you like, give to us to help us on our way? <laughs> okay, well, it's nice to meet you both. Um, I, would, I would say, actually, academically, I'm not very bright at all. I, I was really rubbish at school. Like, I left school at 15 because I knew it all. <laughs> I didn't need to know anything else. I'm done now, so <laughs> I'll be off. Didn't do my GCSEs, never went college, never went uni. Um, so I suppose my career's been um, quite unorthodox in that sense. But I, I would say, just putting yourself in the field. Who am I? But like, just putting yourself, just putting yourself on the ground and just having conversations with people that it directly affects is always really useful. Um, I've learned so so much by having conversations with people I would never have met, you know, under normal circumstances. And then once you're there, you can't help but uh, feel something or, or be intrigued and want to find out more. Um, so as much as you can, I would just go to, to the place, if you can, go to the place that, that you find fascinating and go on the ground, get your phone out and just say, do you want to have a chat? Um, yeah. Thank you. Good luck about, with everything. Yeah, let's go back to the chap in the red T-shirt there. Hello. Hello. Um, so I've just finished university now, film studies, um, and I'm looking at going traveling in Southeast Asia and making a documentary out there nice. of um, just untold stories, like quite similar to yours, but not not quite as intense on my own. Uh, no, don't, um, yeah. <laughs> Mom, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a pickle. How would you like advise getting my work out there afterwards, after I come back and edit it? I feel like, the youngsters, I'm 30 now. Uh, but I feel like young people are in a perfect position now more than ever, actually, because, you know, you know for yourself, it's like YouTubers, bloggers, vloggers, that y you, you have a platform that didn't really exist for us 10 or 15 years ago, so I would just take full advantage of that. And, and if you've got something interesting to say and, you know, you're not repeating the same spiel that we've heard time and time again, then surely people will listen. Um, so I would make the absolute most of, of those platforms that are totally free as well. It's such a touch, it's perfect. The other thing I'd say is there's a session uh, called When the Shit Hits the Fan, which Brit Doc are running, and it's about risk, when managing risk when you're in situations. <laughs> when you've annoyed situations. someone in Southeast Asia. Yeah. <laughs> so go to that session, because there's, okay. and, and there's, there's an organisation called the Rory Peck Foundation yeah. who uh, <coughs> help, help freelance filmmakers when they get into trouble. In not suggesting you will get into trouble, <laughs> but it's good to know about it, just in case. Thank okay, you. let's have a question over on this side. Who's got a question over here? Yes, just here. 
Hello, oh, this is really awkward. Hello. Um, I'm really interested to learn about the children's TV, the TV that you've been making yep. recently. Uh, how's that going? What have you been doing? Um, so I've done CBBC for like uh, maybe five or six years now, and people always find that really, really quite surprising because the stuff we do for three is quite intense and sometimes quite harrowing. And then I go and do like really frivolous kind of fluffy stuff for, for kids. But I think it's nice to have the balance, and you need escapism, else you know you, you would go loopy if you were talking about darkness the entire time. So at the minute I'm making a series, it's a very sweet series actually, it's about, um, it's called The Pets Factor. So we're, we're based in this uh, veterinary in Bristol and the vet's such a sweetheart, like he's a real trooper and the girl behind reception is a star, like she talks to me about, she makes me feel so old, she says, oh did you watch like Geordie Shaw, she's like obsessed with Love Island, I think oh, I'm so out of the loop, <laughs> not with Love Island, but, Shaw. Um, but and, and youngsters bring their, their pets in that are poorly and it's kind of talking about, you know, broader thoughts, the circle of life, you know, eventually he will die, but that's okay, you know, there are, there are new animals coming through. Um, there was like <laughs> snake. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. It's just about replacing people that you yeah, love. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but like I went in the other day and there was like a clip of a snake had swallowed a sock and the sock was full of shit and the sock went flying against the wall. And um, <laughs> yeah, it's very. It's, it's, it's very <laughs> Beg your pardon? I really like it. I mean, we do another series um, called Show Me What You're Made Of, which isn't hugely dissimilar to Blood, Sweat and T-shirts, how I started. And that's why I asked if I could present it. Um, so it's a really simple premise. You bring like five or six brats to the other side of the world, Southeast Asia typically, and you say, you know, look, you've got all of these games, you've got all of these clothes, you know, your, your mum and dad work really hard so that you can have this nice life. And here's a kid, very similar age to you, who works for their, to feed their mother. And so for this tiny moment, they have this kind of revelation, you know, you see it click, my goodness, this world is huge, and actually, we're the lucky ones, we're sat on the other side. That normally lasts about six minutes, <laughs> and then they're moaning that they're hungry, or they want <laughs> their phone, or they've got the ump. Um, but I really like working with kids, yeah. They're so, there's no filter, you know, sometimes when you're, when you're interviewing people, especially in the UK, it can be really tricky, because they kind of... They self-fed it, and they're worrying about every single thing that's coming out of their mouth. Not a problem I have, as we've seen. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, a, it's yeah, it's sometimes a breath of fresh air to hear what they think. Good. How about in the middle, somewhere? Who's got a question over here? Bottom. Okay, on this side. Yes, this lady here. This Hi. Hello. Um, do you ever see yourself getting more directly involved in politics? I think you'd be a great MP. Oh, yeah, my goodness. <laughs> um, do you know what? It's really Prime bizarre. Minister? Yeah, no? Well, I mean... <laughs> um, do you know, a couple of people have said this, and I think, I don't know, you just never know, do you? Like, the, the weirder, weirder things have happened. Like, it's, it's so bizarre. Like, we've had, like, a couple of phone calls, actually, from, like, Question Time and Radio 4. Like, we would love to have you. Like, we really like where it is that you're coming from, and, you know, we feel like your, your, your opinion would be valid, blah, 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 which I find hilarious. But um, I am becoming certainly more and more interested in politics just because you can't help um, because you're so affected and, you know, it, it kind of shapes your everyday life. So who, who knows, man? But then I feel like, I've thought about it a couple of times, and I feel like even if you go in, into it with, you know, the right morals and, and you're there for, for the right reasons, I think you have to play the game and then you probably turn into a bit of a baddie whether you like it or not. But maybe not. You know, Corbs has kind of done okay, hasn't he? <laughs> However many decades later. Well, I don't know. We'll see. Thank you. Over here. Yeah, chap at the end here. Obviously, you've been to some incredibly intense places and situations. I'm just wondering if there's anywhere you wouldn't go at all, or anyone you wouldn't speak to. Ah, um, like off limits or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Because obviously you said that you were packing and you just start, you know, burst out crying. I, know. Oh, I don't want to go. Oh, wimp, I know. I'm shitting myself. Oh, sort yeah, of thing. <laughs> yeah. Is there anywhere, obviously, that I, you wouldn't go? I don't think I would. Oh, you just don't know, though, do you? I, I don't. I mean, if you'd have asked me a couple of years ago, if you'd have said, oh, you're going to go to northern Iraq and be like a kilometre away from ISIS, I'd be like, no, there's no way I'm doing that. So you never really know until the kind of opportunity presents itself. Um, at this moment, I don't think I would go to Syria. Um, and that's, you know, when I see people in Syria, I like reporting and just, you know, ordinary people who don't even work in media that are doing their absolute best to show everyone what's going on. I just think that's, like, I'm so in awe of them. It's so admirable to be that selfless. 
um, because I'm too selfish. I, I don't think I, I don't think I would go to Syria. So um, I think I that's. I think it's being to selfish. Is that feeling well, you don't want to die? Yeah, I don't. I don't want to die. It's only yeah. telling. <laughs> yeah, but that's why I just think it's so remarkable when people who kind of, y you know, do everything within their power to just try and kind of, you know, catch bits and bobs on their phone. It's just they're risking so much just so other people know yeah. what life is like. Um, so yeah, I perhaps not there just just now. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for a couple more. Yes, over here. Hi, yeah. Hello. Um, I, so I'm making a documentary this summer. Um, so obviously I've watched documentaries, but this will be the first one I'm making. Like I'm only 19. So. That's amazing. Um, but I was wondering, like, how do you know, like, what questions to ask? Do you sort of like go uh, with your director, sort of plan them beforehand, or is it sort of in the moment that you come up with, or just like? about it you know it's, it's kind of changed slightly I suppose it's, it's a bit both I suppose so you know the directors are always far more experienced than I am so you know you'd, you'd be crazy to, to dismiss what it is that they're interested in um, so there's sort of general um, topics and questions that you want to touch on but then inevitably they'll give you an answer and you think oh really and then sort of naturally you'll, you'll want to know a bit more about that so I think it's a delicate balance of the two perhaps I love to follow actuality way more than I do sort of sit down kind of um, staged interviews. Yeah. So, yeah, just, and, and you know what, I think as well that the reason perhaps I started getting work in the first place was because it wasn't about me standing up and trying to show everybody how much knowledge I had and, you know, how bright I was, because I think you see that sometimes. I think, you know, it's brilliant to be well prepared and of course you need to do your research, but you're also there to hear from them and for them to tell you what their life is like. So just ask the questions even if they sound or feel stupid. Yeah. If you're thinking it, perhaps someone else might be. Okay. It's interesting that though, because that's that's obviously something that's changed over yeah. the last ten years. Is yeah. that you know, in Blood, Sweat and T shirts, you were the naive the utterly naive totally, reporter. Totally, hundred percent. And that was that was true because yeah, you were. Yeah, hundred percent. Whereas now, you know, if you're talking to a prostitute you talk to hundreds of prostitutes oh, in prostitute, countries I don't all know. over the world. Yeah, yeah. I do. I know so many prostitutes. <laughs> if you're ever at a loose end, I know some <laughs> great, great women. Uh, but yeah, that, that comes with experience, you know. You. So you can't really do the, oh, I don't know stuff no, anymore, because no. you do now. Yeah, I do. You, you yeah. know a lot about their life and about their choices. I'm a bit more informed now, yeah. So yeah, you, you kind of have the authority to, to push when you think you need to. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we've got one last question, and in green with the red headband just there. Hello. Hello. Hi. Can you think of a time or times when you felt really scared? You felt that you are in actual danger? Yeah. Probably every trip, there's one moment where I think, oh, push me luck. Um, I mean, Iraq was, was, was quite hairy. Um, there was a time in Japan, actually, where I think I sort of perhaps got a bit too complacent because I was in Japan, that I got stopped by the police for, for a couple of hours um, and detained because they wanted us to delete some of the footage that we refused to delete. So I, w I wasn't really panicking about, get, you know, about getting arrested. I was panicking about them putting me in a cell because I'm so claustrophobic. I was thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to go... I'm going to lose my mind in this cell. Um, but there have been loads of times, you know, where you think, oh, I've gone too far. Like when we were in Peru, we were on a coke farm and the one thing that the hostile team had said was make sure you get back before, before it's dark because there's pirates that go up and down the Amazon that will rob all your gear and, you know, um, abuse the girls. And Sod's Law, like one question turns into ten and then it's dark and we're coming back and they s we see this boat come in in the opposite direction. I'm like, oh, this is the guy that we've all been warned about. He's going to rob us all. It's all being chased around the Amazon. You know, there have been so many times where I've thought, oh, <laughs> um, but it's fine. It's 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 normally fine. It's generally fine. Yeah, and there are things in place if it all kicks off. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> things in place. Yeah. <laughs> we hope we never have to use those things. <laughs> yeah, I do. Okay, um, I'm thank afraid you. that's all we've got time for. Thank so you thank so you much. all very much for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.